Hi, I'm Dr. Johnson Haas, and welcome to Earth Parts, a free educational netcast bringing geology to all. As a kid, I found the procedural crime TV show Quincy to be fascinating. The idea that the hero of a crime drama is a scientist that, by looking at a dead body and examining the details, you can piece together information about how that person died. You weren't there at the time, you weren't there to see it, but with all the evidence that the body carries with it, you can piece together enough evidence that you can convict someone of a crime. And that idea also motivates a lot of our study of fossils, fossils of ancient life long gone. And in this episode, that's what I want to talk about, fossils and what they are, how they form, how they, different ways that they can be preserved. And so we're going to start with the definition of what a fossil is. A fossil is a trace of ancient life preserved in the rock record of sedimentary rock. A fossil differs from something that's just dead a long time in that it is geologically changed into a form that is less prone to rotting when it's exposed at the Earth's surface again. Although that's not a hard and fast rule, as we'll see, because I want to give you a few examples of things that are and aren't fossils. Let's look at something that's been dead a long time, but is still around as an object. Something like the Egyptian pharaoh King Tutankhamun. This is a famous dead body. It's a corpse. It's a mummy that's been preserved artificially and then preserved in a stable geologic setting of a sort inside of a tomb where the body's decomposition is slowed immensely. But it is not really a fossil. It's a mummy. And we can tell a lot about the person, Tutankhamun himself, simply by examining the body in detail. We know that he had serious back problem. A lot of his upper vertebrae were fused and he couldn't turn his head around the time of his death. We know that he'd had multiple infections of malaria during his lifetime. He had a club foot and he probably died from an infection relating to a broken leg. Pharaoh Tutankhamun died about 33 centuries ago, about 3300 years. We can go back further than that and look at, for example, the preserved mummy Urtzi, found in the Tyrolean Alps in 1991. Urtzi died about 52 to 5300 years ago, about 52 or 53 centuries ago. And his body was not preserved in a tomb. He died out in the Alps, out in the open, and was preserved simply because the body came to rest where it lay, underneath a small alcove of rock where a glacier that later formed could creep above the body and not smear it out into nothing over time. Urtzi was mummified under snow and under ice later, and was preserved as a natural mummy. And as a result, we can tell a lot about him. We can tell a lot about his medical history, how old he was, what kind of food he ate, where he was generally from. We know what his last two meals were. We know that he bled to death after being shot with an arrow in the back and apparently tried to pull it out. He already had head trauma from presumably a fight with whoever killed him. We know that he had Lyme disease. We know that he was lactose intolerant. He had tattoos a complex set of kit, including clothes and tools that tell us a lot about the time, and that's just from one body. If we go back further than that, the record gets thinner because rarely do things like that get preserved that well. That's an exceptional case. But if you go back further, you start to reach the time of things like frozen carcasses of mammoths in the Arctic, things that are tens of thousands of years old, hundreds of thousands of years old sometimes, preserved as natural mummies in tundra in peat and are frozen and desiccated just like Urtzi. These we would be more comfortable calling fossils. They've been in the ground certainly a much longer period of time. And they have started to compress down and be geologically altered by the weight of material above them. To be truly considered a fossil, something has to have been changed by the process of burial and preservation over time. That's how it's preserved. Usually a bone piece, for example, will have groundwater that moves through it, through the voids and the pore spaces in the bone, and can deposit crystals of calcium carbonate or silica over time or other minerals and can simply fill in the empty spaces with stone, essentially rock. And this will preserve the fossil's overall shape and structure, and some of the original material is still in there as bone remnants. So something like Lucy, the famous fossil of an Australopithecus afarensis specimen recovered from East Africa. Lucy is an example of an early hominid, an ancestral cousin species of ours. Archaeologists could only find about 40% of her skeleton. The rest gone, scattered, eroded away. We don't know. But Lucy preserves enough information that we can tell, for example, how we think she died and how old she was, that it was a she, a female. And we can also tell about her species and how her species differs from ours. We can trace part of our ancestral lineage as hominids through examining the dead bodies, essentially, of 
ancient, ancient ancestors like these. Once a fossil is trapped in rock and preserved geologically, then it will remain that way often very stably for a very long period of time. And even if a fossil is tens or even hundreds of millions of years old, we can learn a lot about that individual animal, its species, how it died, what its environment was like, and a lot more. For example, the fossilized skeletal remains of the Tyrannosaurus rex that's been popularly named Sue, now on display at the Field Museum in Chicago. This is the fossilized skeleton of a Tyrannosaurus rex, and its existence alone provides us with a great deal of information about what the T-Rex species was like by giving us another individual. The more individual fossils we have of a species, the more information we can gather and develop statistics about what variation within that species existed. We can also get information about the individual animal itself and its medical history and sometimes what led to its death. For the example of Sue, the T-Rex, we know that this dinosaur was 28 years old. We know that the animal had survived earlier bone damage from attacks from some other dinosaur, and that those wounds had healed, that the animal had survived the incident and moved on. We know that one of the calf bones was larger than the other, suggesting that the animal suffered from an infection during its lifetime. There were also cavities found on the skull, suggesting that it had suffered the results of parasite infections. Even if a dead body is very old, we can still learn a lot about it, although in Sue's case we don't actually know her specific cause of death. The chance that any individual organism is going to be preserved as a fossil in rock for the geologic future is astronomically low, but there are astronomically large numbers of individual organisms that have existed throughout Earth's history. If one out of a billion snail shells is preserved in sand or in limestone, and the population of that particular region of the ocean is several hundred billion snails at any given moment, then your odds become a little bit less astronomical that some of them can be preserved in the rock. To be preserved, you have to be buried faster than you can rot. Essentially, any fossil is the remains of a life form. So that life form, that individual, has to be covered in sediment, buried out of the presence of oxygen so that it doesn't physically rot away very quickly, or be subject to destruction from predators ripping it apart. And then it stands a chance of being preserved in the collected sediment as it compacts to eventually become what we would consider a fossil. There are many ways that a life form can be preserved as a fossil in the rock record. And mummification is actually not a very common way for that to happen. There are only a few very ancient mummies, mummified dinosaur tissue, for example, exists, but those samples are very rare. And they were preserved in rock under particularly unusual conditions to allow it. So most of the time when we're talking about fossils, we're not talking about mummies. Perhaps the most common way for fossils to be preserved is in limestone. Limestone rock is made of calcium carbonate, but that calcium carbonate is composed of the microscopic skeletons, the shells, of planktonic organisms, things like coccolithophores and other forms of plankton that lay down shells around themselves that are composed of solid, essentially, limestone mineral calcite or aragonite calcium carbonate. As time goes on in the ocean and this material sifts down through wave after wave over the years of dead plankton cells from above, then this material begins to accumulate and you sort of build this carbonate mud in which organisms can fall and become, their skeletons can become trapped. If the life form is one that is larger, hand sample sized or larger, that produces a calcium carbonate shell around itself, like many mollusks do, or many arthropods, like trilobites in the ancient past, and many forms of coral today and in the ancient past as well. All these forms of life produce skeletal components that are made of the same material that limestone is made of. When they fall into the ocean sediments and are preserved as fossils, the fleshy parts of a coral will decompose away pretty quickly, but what will be left behind are the hard mineral skeletal components the calcite or aragonite calcium carbonate. And so these preserve really easily, and you'll find often the best fossils uh, will be limestone rock that is fossil bearing. Often in such rock, the fossils will weather out intact in many cases. Arguably the most valuable individual fossil in the world, in fact, is a limestone fossil, but not of coral, of an early bird. Archaeopteryx, most famous example of this fossil is iconic and instantly recognizable, and it is the sample that is displayed now in the Berlin Natural History Museum in Germany. This was not the first Archaeopteryx fossil found, but it is the most complete, and with the most complete skull. It was preserved in the Solenhofen limestone, an extremely fine-grained limestone that in fact has been used to make lithographs 
phonograph print blocks for centuries, and it's almost a perfect fossil. The bones are permineralized to some extent, but they are still present. And the most remarkable thing about the specimen is that it shows us in such fine detail the impressions of the feathers laid into the soft limestone mud that the bird fell into after it died. The fossil is famous because it shows an early transitional form of feathered dinosaurs that had learned to fly, and so sported full aerodynamic wings instead of decorative feather displays on the limbs, which I'll talk about in a separate video. Turns out fossils have many uses. In the Paleozoic era, there was a group of coral that were common in the oceans at that time, but are now extinct. They're called the rugose coral, sometimes called the horn coral. And they were individual coral polyps that would grow a calcium carbonate structure around themselves for protection as they lived. Rugose corals would lay down a fresh layer of calcium carbonate beneath their polyp tissue in the cup that they grew around themselves. Every day, a new layer would lay down. Very thin, microscopic, you have to section the coral fossil in half, polish it, and look at the cross-section under a microscope to see the individual layer. You can actually detect how many of these daily growth bands an individual rugose coral would put down. You have cyclic seasonal changes that imprint themselves in the thickness of the layers, and these repeating cycles tell you what an annual uh, repeat would look like. Now here's the thing. Geophysicists have long predicted that the Earth should have begun after its formation, about 4.6 billion years ago, with a much faster spin rate than it has now. The Moon would have been orbiting much closer to the Earth than it is now. And over time, the gravitational drag of the Sun and on the Moon by its orbit around Earth should have slowed down the Earth's rotation rate. Hundreds of millions of years ago, a year, which was the same length total of time because we haven't changed our distance from the Sun, but days would be shorter and a year would have more. And so what you see in rugose corals is exactly that. The annual growth pattern of rugose corals shows us that in, for example, the Silurian period, the year was about 420 some odd days long. In the following Devonian period, the year was about 410 days long. And this is exactly what a geophysical argument calculation based upon orbital mechanics and geophysics would predict. So in this case, you have a strange connection, uh, but a very informative one, between the scientific fields of paleontology and the field of geophysics and astronomy. Another way that fossils can be preserved is in shale. Shale is very fine-grained clay and dust-sized particles have been carried by rivers to the ocean where they accumulate layers of mud. Over time this compacts down to form shale rock. If there are any life forms trapped in that material though, that mud originally, they can be preserved. The shale is fine-grained enough that it tends to preserve fossils nicely and they will render down to a, usually a black carbon residue. There are many locations of shale around the world that preserve fossils really well. Perhaps the most famous being the Burgess Shale exposed in Canada in the mountains today, but it was laid down in an ancient sea. The individual animals have rendered down to a carbon residue, but it is so fine in its preservation of detail that we can tell what even the soft body parts were like. So fleshy organisms like a sea anemone or the soft body parts of a coral, worms, other forms of life that don't really have hard parts normally don't preserve well. But in this fine-grained material, under the right conditions of very low oxygen, fossils allow us an intriguing window into ocean reef environment of the Cambrian period. Volcanic ash is also good at preserving fossils. When a volcano erupts and emits a giant ash cloud that falls over the terrain nearby, it can lay down meters thick of ash, although the material is fine-grained and so it sifts down from the sky. Lakes can fill up with ash and anything alive in them can be preserved in that fine-grained material with exquisite precision. A famous example of this being the Green River Formation of Wyoming, Colorado, and Utah. The Green River Formation is a set of volcanic ash beds laid down in what were at the time a group of intermontane lakes in the mountain west of North America. Today, it is a vast treasure trove of fossils. Sandstone is not typically very good for fossil preservation because the grains are so coarse that as the material compacts in the sandstone, it tends to destroy most remains of ancient life form. But there are some exceptions, most famously the sandstones of the Ediacaran Hills of Australia. In this situation, a fairly fine-grained sandstone has managed under unusual conditions to preserve the impressions of ancient life forms that lived at the time. This is important because the Ediacaran sandstones that we're talking about were laid down before the Cambrian, before there were large fossils of animals with hard parts. And so the Ediacaran fossils in fine-grained sandstone are impressions of soft-bodied organisms. They represent some of the strangest, most unusual types of life forms ever to exist on Earth, and many are unclassifiable into any other known animal group. 
Another fairly common form of fossilization is what we call permineralization. And if you've seen what's called petrified wood, you've already seen permineralized rock. In that case, the wood, like bone, is a spongy structure. If that material is down in a sediment, water moving through that's charged with calcium carbonate or dissolved silica can precipitate that material in the void spaces in the bone or the wood. And so you essentially replace most of the original mass of the dead object with solid rock, quartz and agate forming beautiful rock specimens, such as that Petrified Forest National Park, where within the boundaries of the park, you don't collect anything. You don't have to because just outside the park are many rock shops. If fluids moving through porous sediment that contain fossils are charged with iron sulfide dissolved in the water, then you can actually dissolve the original calcium carbonate of the shell and replace it entirely with pyrite, the shape intact. And this is quite striking if you see these in rock shops or jewelry stores. Finally, and perhaps most famously, amber. Amber is a semi-precious gem, and it used to be the resinous sap of a tree that lived millions of years ago. And a large globule of the sap was able to get buried along with whatever else was around, wood, leaf, plant material, in sediment. But because it's a hardened resin, it will survive the ages sometimes quite well. And deposits where amber is found uh, yield samples that can contain other life forms trapped in the original sap, such as mosquitoes, flies, bees, other plant remains, and even parts of dinosaurs. In this case, a popular gemstone is itself a fossil entirely.